Good afternoon. We are very pleased to welcome all our uh, foreign visitors and listeners. We are very happy that you were would like, wanted to join us for today and for our symposium, our 13th International Symposium. Um, hello again, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, the 13th International Scientific Symposium uh, is about positive approach in applied behavior analysis, supporting people, ISD, and their families. Uh, I will have the pleasure to lead uh, our symposium together with uh, Dr. Anna Bodzińska. My name is Iwona Ruta Sominka. I am the deputy the director of Institute for Child Development uh, in Gdańsk. At the beginning, I have uh, really short uh, inform August national information. During the entire symposium, it is not possible to ask questions on the chat. Uh, if you have any questions, you can uh, send them directly to the speakers or to our uh, email addresses uh, on the page, so you can write down it. Uh, and. Uh, in this part, this is the second part, the first part was in Polish, uh, and now uh, we will uh, have our excellent uh, speakers uh, from abroad, from uh, United States and from Norway. Uh, in this part, we'll have six presentations, uh, and the break will be after the third presentation, short break. Uh, so, but now it's time uh, for the first lecture. Uh, I would like to introduce our speakers. Uh, Dr. Anna Budzinska, she's a creator and uh, the director of uh, Institute for Child Development. Uh, she also uh, teaches the courses uh, uh, in ABA at the University of Gdańsk. And Dr. Budzinska has published many research articles, books, and uh, she's also the author of online ABA course, 15 Minutes for Treatment. And our second uh, speaker is Anna Lubomirska. Uh, she works as a, a ABA therapist in our institute from the 2006. And uh, since uh, 12 years, she works uh, also as a trainer and supervisor. And uh, she's also a PhD student at Oslo Met University in Norway. And she should defend her doctorate in April. So we keep our finger crossed for you, Anna. Good luck. And now uh, I just welcome my colleagues to start the lecture. Thank you, Ivona, for wonderful introduction. And uh, hello, Anya. <laughs> Anya, hello. You... Good afternoon. Hello. Hello. Um, I will just start. Uh, so, as Ivona told, if you will have any questions to our presenters, pre please send them to the addresses you will see on our main presentation on to, or to our, um, to our email address. I will just say you some words about Institute for Child Development. And we uh, provide uh, help to children with autism spectrum disorder and their families since 2006. The effectiveness of ABA treatment has been confirmed and proved by numerous of scientific studies. And our institutes consist of treatment, education and research and use only scientific methods based on ABA. We train specialists from Poland and Europe and assist in establishing similar institutions in many countries. And the Institute cooperates with the, Insti uh, the University of Gdańsk, uh, also Technology University, Medical University, uh, with University in, Tor in Torun and Oslo Med University in Norway. You can just see our homepage and if you would like to read more information, we have also English. Uh, homepage so you can find some information about our institute just there. And uh, our institute is one of the founding member, members of Alliance for Scientific Autism Intervention, ASAI. The organization was founded in 
2017 by several leaders of organizations that operate from scientifically validated system uh, described by McLanahan and Krantz to provide effective autism intervention services to those in need. The leaders of ASAI have worked closely together for over 20 years implementing this system. These systems have repeatedly proven effective across programs for children, adolescents and adults with autism, both nationally and internationally. And we will we were talking about positive approach of ABA in our institute in Polish. So I would just highlight some very important information also in English. First of all, we offer professional help uh, adhering to the highest ethical standards. We begin each treatment with creating a bond with the child. After the initial period when we are sure that the child feels comfortable at our institute, we start preparing educational programs and creating individualized motivational system. Educational treatment should be practical and include all areas of functioning. Only in this way, we can help a child with autism to become an independent and happy person. Thanks to ABA studies, we know that we need to use different kinds of reward to make the training pleasant and comfortable for the child. A good motivational system makes the children feel happy and proud of their achievements. Each bit of effort, even the slightest, should be noticed and rewarded by the teacher according to the motivational system. The child's future and all the skills she he masters depends on the teacher decision. But it's why it's so important to develop and develop all the time what we are doing today. And I would like to recommend our ABA online courses, course 15 minutes for treatment. We have prepared 33 instructional episodes that together give a full picture of the intervention we recommend. No limit, time limit. You can watch every ep episode in different order anytime you want to. There is also a package of educational materials helpful in treatment. And we provide a lot of research. We are very proud of number of the publications we have, thanks to our close cooperation with Oslo Met University. And uh, Anja Lugomirska is a very important person in this cooperation because she writes her doctor thesis uh, at the university in Oslo. And uh, I will now let her to tell more about her uh, PhD project. So now, uh, welcome Anja Lubomirska. Um, okay, so as uh, Anja said, uh, uh, one of the projects uh, developed uh, in uh, Ivoerde in close cooperation with Oslo at University of Norway concerns social referencing. And it is divided into three studies, uh, being actually three phases of this research, each of them uh, described in separate article, uh, which are all uh, available online, for example, on our web page. So the first phase uh, is developing of the social referencing observation scale based on the behaviors of children of typical development. Second, second phase was uh, using this scale as a screening instrument for autism spectrum disorder. And third phase was uh, an attempt to teach social referencing, namely its first component, which is reacting to ambiguous stimuli. 
And the background for this research is a steep and constant increase in the prevalence of autism spectrum disorder throughout the world, but at the same time, still existing delays in diagnosing this disorder. So despite having uh, better diagnostic tools, uh, we can observe these de delays uh, in diagnosing ASD. So we, were, we tried to figure out uh, why these delays are still uh, existing. And we have two thoughts. First of them was that many screeners are based on behaviors or deficits that are typical for different disorders. So not only for ASD, but also for other disorders. But the most important thing was that uh, in order to get a diagnosis for the child, parents need to appoint a visit in clinic, which means that they have to have some kind of resources, resources in time, very often resources in money, but also uh, resources in knowledge about typical development. So in other words, they have to be already concerned about the child development in order to seek help in clinic. So we tried to work around these difficulties. And that's why we've chosen social referencing as our construct, uh, because it is uh, one of the most important deficits in children with ASD, being at the same time not typical for other disorders. Uh, but we also uh, uh, have chosen social referencing because of its impact on future development, uh, for example, on early communication and language, uh, creating secure attachment, but also because of the strong link between deficits in social referencing and uh, challenging behaviors in future. So what we generally have aimed to do was to make a screening a part of the standard preschool evaluation. So actually, we, we've had two goals. Our first goal was to create a reliable and valid, easily conducted direct observation scale to assess social referencing. In this scale, we need behaviors, we need items that are well operationalized easily observed in short scenarios, reliably measured and easily converted to points. Then uh, we uh, want to use this scale for young children. And then we also want a preschool teacher, so non-professional, no psychologist, for example, to be able uh, to do the observation, but also to score it and to interpret the results. Uh, so, um, as a way of validation, our scale, our results in this scale, we compared them uh, to the results of uh, social reciprocity scale by uh, Constantino and Gruber, SRS2, uh, which also to some extent measures social referencing. Uh, and we also assessed uh, reliability through assessing uh, unweighted kappas, and uh, it appeared that uh, all items that state that uh, were left in the final version of the scale uh, were highly reliable. So uh, in order to do this, we also need a clear uh, and uh, concise uh, and precise uh, um, definition of social referencing. Uh, that's why uh, we base here on the definition created by Garrits and Peles Nogueras and also described in uh, studies by De Quinzo, Poulson, Townsend and Taylor, where social referencing is described as a behavior chain containing two links, each consisting of stimulus and response. Altogether, we have four steps. The first step is an ambiguous novel stimulus, for example, an unfamiliar adult or situation. And in case of our study, it was the experimenter changing her facial expressions. This leads to step two, which is observing, or in other words, referencing a present person by the child. In our case, it was observing the experimenter. 
this leads to step three, which is some kind of response from this observed person, some verbal and nonverbal cues. In our case, it was experimenters invitation to play with the materials. And this leads to the last step, which is child's next response. Uh, so uh, this behavior chain, this social referencing behavior chain was repeated in each of three scenarios. Uh, we have fear, pain, and joy scenario. And it means that in fear scenario, for example, the child observes uh, the experimenter experiencing fear and displaying this uh, fear through her, uh, through her uh, facial expressions. In pain scenario, uh, we have the experimenter uh, experiencing pain and in joy scenario, we have experimenter uh, experiencing joy. In order to be sure that preschool teacher uh, should be able to do the observation, uh, he or she gets the description of scenarios and possibly also video material. Scoring should be done immediately following the completion of, of each scenario based on live observation. And every time item can be scored either zero or one. So zero means typical uh, social referencing behavior uh, as it is operationalized and score of one is given for any other type of response, partial response or no response at all. And children who are scored six points or more are considered at risk. And this information uh, is given to parents in order to start uh, uh, diagnostic process in clinic. Uh, and our goal too was to teach observed deficits. As for our results, the most typical social referencing behavior while encountering an ambiguous stimulus was to observe th the reaction of other person before taking any action. So it is actually uh, an exact reflection of social referencing behavior chain. So all the behaviors that were outside this chain uh, were not so common and were not left in the final version of the scale. Uh, also, what we saw was a some kind of negativity bias, uh, meaning that looking at the person experiencing fear and pain was recorded more often than uh, looking at the person experiencing joy. Uh, and this negativity bias is also reported in other studies. Uh, in total scores, there were no significant differences between genders or ages. There were significant differences though between scores of children of typical development and children with ASD and there were almost no overlap between their results. And further analysis showed that the scale, our scale SOROS, scores, its scores significantly predict an ASD diagnosis and has good sensitivity and specificity because uh, our goal was to use the SOROS as a screener. Uh, sensitivity was more important for us than specificity as for screeners it should be. And this table, I think, nicely present this almost no overlap between the results of ASD and uh, TD group, where we can see that uh, in a group of children with autism spectrum disorder, uh, there were no children, no participants uh, with uh, this low amount of points and uh, more points may, means more participants. And it was the other way around in group of children of typical development, because we have to remember here that higher scores means less social referencing behaviors observed. And uh, after uh, this analysis, we wanted also to teach these deficits and we start we've started from teaching the uh, first step of social referencing behavior chain, uh, which is reacting to ambiguous stimuli. Uh, in our study, it was precisely reacting to new and missing objects in the environment. 
reacting was operationalized as initiation interaction with teacher through making eye contact with the teacher and saying, look. There were six steps of training where step six was mix of all steps. And we had six participants, uh, all children with ASD. So uh, uh, every child begins from uh, uh, learning how to react when the object was, uh, when some new object appear in his environment, firstly in his classroom, then in other parts of the preschool. Then uh, children were taught uh, reacting to uh, missing objects, first in their classrooms, then in other parts of preschool. Uh, then children were taught uh, reacting to uh, changed objects. So one object was missing, but it was replaced by, by some other object. And as I said before, step number six was a mix of all these previous steps. And all our participants acquired this ability within six months of teaching, training, teaching, some of them earlier, some of them later on, but all of them within six months of training. And what's important, this skill was generalized to new people and new objects. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you, Anya. I, I'm sure you will be PhD in uh, one month. Thank you very much. Uh, if you are, you, if you would like to ask questions, you can write to this email address. And now I would like to introduce my colleagues from USA, from Institute for Educational Achievement, which is also the part of ASAI. And I would like to introduce Christine Cassidy and Eric Rosenblatt. Uh, both are, are BCBA, means uh, they are um, certified uh, therapists. And they will talk about the importance of ethics to help guide beneficial intervention to individuals with autism. And welcome, uh, Christine. Hello. Hello, can you hear me okay? Yes, we can hear you. We can see you have beautiful daylight. We have almost evening um, and wish you good luck. And now your turn. Great, thank you. Um, hello, as Anna said, my name is Christine Cassidy and I'm excited to have the opportunity to present to you today on this topic. The Institute for Educational Achievement is a nonprofit organization located in the United States. We provide autism intervention to children and adults. I am the assistant director of our adult program. Today, I am going to speak to you about the importance of applied behavior analysis and how it contributes to a positive approach to changing behavior. As all of us probably know, autism spectrum disorder is a developmental disability. The intervention needs may vary from person to person, but providing individualized instructions using the principles of ABA to meet the needs of the individuals we serve becomes critically important. Individuals with autism may be different and that characteristics they display may vary. For example, deficits associated with autism include, but are not limited to, persistent impairments with skills related to communication and social behavior. For example, failure of normal back and forth conversation, reduced sharing of interests, emotions or affects, and abnormalities in eye contact and body language to name a few. Further, individuals with autism often have difficulties developing, maintaining and understanding relationships. For example, they may have difficulty in making friends. Other characteristics include restricted repetitive patterns of behavior. Autism is often associated with extreme distress to small changes, difficulty with transitions, and limited interests. As you can imagine, these impairments significantly impact an individual's opportunities to live a typical life. 
teaching individuals with autism to remain appropriately engaged and complete tasks without assistance from others is crucial in promoting their independence and improving their quality of life. Additionally, it may help to minimize the concern that parents have about their child becoming independent members of their families and the greater community. I'd like to focus for a few minutes on what sets ABA apart from other interventions. Applied behavior analysis is a science devoted to understanding and improving human behavior. Behavior analysts focus on improving behavior that enhances and improves people's lives. We ensure that interventions include objective descriptions, measurement, and demonstrate reliable relationships between their interventions and the behavioral improvement. Also, the behavior analyst designs programs that are based on behavior analytic principles, including assessments of effects of other intervention methods not associated with ABA. Also, decisions about interventions involve the client or the client surrogate in planning of such programs, always obtains consent of the client, and respects the rights of the, of the client to terminate services at any time. Additionally, the behavior analyst reviews and appraises the restrictiveness of alternate interventions and always recommends the least restrictive procedures likely to be effective in dealing with problem behavior. Also, the behavior analyst certification board known as the BACB has an extensive code of ethics, which we'll discuss in a few minutes. Some 35 plus years ago, a group of prominent behavior analysts started a task force on the right to effective treatments and arguably wrote one of the most important articles in applied behavior analysis. Remember, this was prior to the development of the BACB ethical guidelines that exist today. Van Houten and colleagues 1988 state that behavior analysts have a professional obligation to make available the most effective treatments that the discipline can provide. They recognized that individuals that are receiving services needed to be protected and treated ethically. They go on to further identify six areas that affect a person's right to effective behavior intervention. They state that individuals who are recipients or potential recipients of treatment designed to change their behavior have the right to a therapeutic environment, have the right to services whose overriding goal is personal welfare, have the right to treatment by a competent behavior analyst, have the right to programs that teach functional skills, have the right to behavior assessments and ongoing evaluation, and have the right to the most effective treatment procedures available. First, the right to a therapeutic environment means that the environment used for intervention must be safe, humane, and responsive to the individual's needs. This includes ensuring that preferences of the individuals who are receiving treatments are avail available to them. Also, keep in mind the defined characteristics of a least restrictive environment consists of individual freedoms to move and access to preferred items rather than types of locations. Here is a picture that helps to demonstrate what a least restrictive environment looks like. This individual um, who has a history of engaging in some challenging behavior um, and through the use of successful and effective intervention, uh, it has completely changed his life. There are many things we do to promote a least restrictive environment. This individual has free choice of where to participate in his reward choices and has a variety of rewards readily available to him. Additionally, he eats lunch with his friends and cooks lunch in the kitchen. Also, I must emphasize that this environment is most appropriate for him at this time to ensure he receives effective intervention. Second, an individual has the right to services whose overriding goal is personal welfare. Behavior intervention has two primary purposes. They are to teach functional skills and to promote independence. One would argue that these are two of the most important goals. All a parent can ask for is for their child to be happy and to live the most independent life possible. 
As a parent myself, I strive for those same goals for my children. Remember, it is important to demonstrate behavior change that allows our learners to participate and be active members of their families and communities. Here on the bottom right is a picture of learners who have attended IEA for 25 plus years. Over the years, the young lady in the middle has learned to cook and bake, and, is one of, and this is one of her favorite things to do. Those that love to cook also en enjoy uh, sharing what they cook with others. Likewise, we have taught the learners at IEA to do the same, as the, is the case here in this photograph. Another example of functional skills is maintaining a healthy lifestyle. As a result, we teach learners a variety of skills to maintain their health. As you can see on the right, this individual is learning to engage in a physical fitness routine, which has long-term health benefits. These are just two examples of ways in which we teach functional skills and increase independence. Next, an individual has the right to a treatment by a competent behavior analyst. This means providing appropriate education and experiences, knowledge of behavior principles, clinical competence, and when a treatment is complex, there must be involvement with someone who has more knowledge in the area, such as a behaviorist, at a doctoral level. Also, an individual has the right to programs that teach functional skills. As I mentioned earlier, teaching functional skills is one of the primary components of effective behavior intervention. Improvement of functioning may take several forms, so let's take a minute to uh, look at some of them. First, teaching learners new skills to maintain those skills over time and to generalize those skills to other areas of their life is important. Sec second, the acquisition of behavior that competes with stereotypic or otherwise inappropriate behavior. By accomplishing steps one and two, it increases the opportunity to teach and promote independence and further social acceptability. Here are a variety of photos taken over the years um, of an individual who has attended IEA since we opened in 1996. He has a history of being overweight, engaged in frequent tantrum behavior, and had a significant fixation on food that had a direct impact on his and his family's quality of life. Over the years, we taught him to tolerate eating a variety of non-preferred foods, to cook his own foods, and to work around foods in a kitchen. Let me now show you the, uh, uh, some current pictures of the same learner. Here he is with a peer at work. Uh, he is currently employed as a prep chef in a kitchen. This was possible because we taught him a variety of functional skills over the years at IEA. And now he has the opportunity to sustain employment doing a job that he loves. And as you can see in the second picture, um, his cooking skills have developed quite nicely and he's able to cook independently for himself and also cooks for his family. In addition to the importance of teaching functional skills, the individual has the right to behavioral assessments and ongoing evaluation. At IEA, some ways we conduct ongoing assessments are that we identify and alternate reinforcer choices. This ensures that what a learner is motivated by is available for rewards. Additionally, we evaluate the ABCs of behavior, including but not limited to the time of day that the behavior occurs or how often it occurs. Staff are responsible for ongoing data collection and analysis and new goals are identified frequently. Staff are also responsible for identifying prerequisite skills needed to teach those goals. We continually identify and assess the ongoing progress of these goals to ensure that the individuals lead the most independent and happy, happy lives as possible. Finally, an individual has the right to the most effective procedures available to teach goals. The individual has the right to and is in fact entitled to effective and scientifically validated treatments. So the procedures that we teach related to the skill, uh, the procedures that we implement related to the skills that we teach are scientifically validated. We do not create procedures based on how we feel but rather what the science demonstrates is effective. 
So those were the six areas of responsible behavior analytic practices outlined by Van Houten and colleagues. About 10 to 12 years later, the Behavior Analyst Certification Board, known as the BACB, released an original version of the Code of Ethics. As a field, behavior analysis continues to expand. So too do the ethical standards of the field. Fast forward decades later, now the BACB includes four core principles that all behavior analysts should strive to embody. According to the first core principle, a behavior analyst works to maximize uh, benefit and do no harm. Some of the points outlined include that behavior analysts strive to protect the rights and the welfare of the, of the clients that they work with. Additionally, they, they effectively and respectfully collaborate with others in the best interest of those with whom they work and always place the client's interests first. The second core principle is to treat others with compassion, dignity, and respect. Behavior analysts treat others equitably regardless of many factors, for example, age, ethnicity, or gender. They protect others' privacy and confidentiality and actively promote client self-determination to the best of their abilities. Additionally, they acknowledge that personal choice and service delivery is important by providing clients with necessary information to make informed choices about services. The third core principle is to behave with integrity. Behavior analysts should behave in an honest and trustworthy manner, which also, enco also encompasses following through with obligations, holding themselves accountable for their work and being knowledgeable about and upholding the current BACB requirements. Last, behavior analysts must ensure their competence. This means that behavior analysts must remain within their professional scope of practice, including remaining current and increasing their knowledge of the practices and advancements in ABA. Behavior analysts must always work to continually increase their knowledge and skills in all aspects of their job. Here at IEA, once every two weeks, staff are educated on all aspects of their job responsibilities to ensure they are acquiring knowledge related to ABA and to increase their clinical and professional repertoires. As mentioned previously, the BACB has an extensive code of ethics. In other words, the BACB has created a list of specific rules uh, of conduct Organizations similar to IEA have adopted these ethical codes of behavior to provide guidelines to their staff members to follow. The goal is to ensure the welfare of those entrusted in one's care. And keep in mind, ethical codes may vary from culture to culture. As outlined by Cooper et al., behavior analysts must ask themselves three fundamental questions concerning ethical practice. What is the right thing to do? What it, what it is worth doing, and what does it mean to be a good behavior analyst? At IEA, staff are held accountable for making decisions based on these core principles and ethical standards. It is crucial that an association adopt these ethical codes and principles. Here are a few examples of how we at IEA ensure that ethical standards are being prioritized. As outlined by Van Houten and colleagues in cases, in which withholding or implementing treatment involves potential risk, peer-reviewed committees and human rights committees play distinct roles in protecting client welfare. Here at IEA, we have a human rights committee comprised of members of the community who review skill acquisition programs and treatment packages to ensure the welfare of our individuals within the organization. The committee members are educated are, um, excuse me, are not educated in the field of applied behavior analysis, but are looking at the skills we teach and how we teach them to determine whether the rights of our learners are being protected. Here is another way we address these questions. It is also established that each procedure implemented has obtained current consent from the individual or the individual's guardian to ensure we are prioritizing their rights. Also, extensive training is provided to all staff within the program 
who provide intervention to the learners. And then our, our training is supervised by a BCBA at a doctoral level. Also, as part of our extension of services, we go into the home and help parents or guardians to identify goals related to skills displayed at home or in the community. And we provide training to the parents and family members to ensure that individuals display the necessary skills to lead the most independent lives within their families and the community. This also ensures that parents have the necessary skills to implement strategies and tools so they remain an active role in intervention and help to address needs of their children. The training provided to family members empowers them to make decisions based on the best interest of their son or daughter. Also, parents are encouraged to attend school visits once a month to observe the programming being provided. This ensures they are actively participating and have a thorough understanding of the goals identified, how they are taught, and how the progress of those goals are being accomplished. Some may have an inaccurate picture of what ABA is. For example, I have heard some people refer to ABA as rigid or unfriendly when in fact it is quite the opposite. The individuals who we work with and our client population with our client population are patient, kind, and compassionate and treat all learners with dignity and respect. As outlined with this, in this presentation, there are many guidelines to uphold and protect the rights of our clients. I would like to leave you today with a few key thoughts in mind. Remember, behavior analysts are required to lead and make decisions based on what is ethically right. I'd like you to remember that our goals are to teach individuals to be independent, to improve their quality of life, and to minimize family concern and achieve the goals that are important within their families. It is quite remarkable what can be accomplished, and I'd like to emphasize the remarkable impact ABA has had on the learners at IEA and their families. Um, as Anna mentioned earlier, IEA is also um, a member of the Alliance for Scientific Autism Intervention, um, and we are proud and happy to be a part of it. Thank you so much for giving me the opportunity to speak to all of you today. Um, if you have any questions, please feel free to email me, uh, the email on the screen. Yes, thank you, Christine, for a very interesting uh, presentation. And uh, it is very important that we can see that behavior analysts take care about all needs all rights of the uh, people, uh, students uh, uh, with whom they are working every day. So thank you very much. You're very welcome. Thank you for having me. Uh, Emily Galant, if you are, if you are together with us. Yes, we can Hi. see. Yes, thank you. I hope uh, we will give uh, Ala Moskalet time to contact with us. Oh. Uh, now, yes, I would like to introduce uh, Emily Galant. Uh, she's from Somerset Hills uh, Learning Institute in the United States. And we cooperate for, since many years. So, Emily, uh, you have very, very interesting subjects. So, Talk us about the parents and how to make the success. Yes, okay. thank you. Yeah. Great. Thank you so much for having me. Um, dobre vichor. So good evening to everyone in Europe and Poland. Oh, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. I tried. I practiced. I hope it was yeah, okay. It was very well. <laughs> good afternoon to those in the U.S. Welcome, everyone, to Making Parenting a Win-Win how to succeed at teaching your child wherever you are. Um, my name is Emily Gallant. I'm honored to be here presenting on behalf of Somerset Hills Learning Institute, like the Institute for Educational Achievement, which you just heard about from Kristen Cassidy. We are a private school for children with autism in the US. We currently serve about 30 students with autism and their families delivering uh, services based on the science of applied behavior analysis. 
I'd like to extend my appreciation to my colleagues, Dr. Sandra Gomes, and especially our executive director here at SHLI, Dr. Kevin Brothers, as well as our mentors, Drs. Pat Krantz and Lynn McClanahan, for their roles in laying the foundation of this approach to supporting our children's parents in becoming the teachers their children with autism need them to be. Oh good, my slides are working. So those words, the teachers their children with autism need them to be, are very carefully chosen. Though we know how important good communication and cooperative planning are between school and caregivers, it's just as important for students' outcomes, ultimately, that parents have the skills to support and teach their children when we can't be there. This is because we know that autism is a lifelong disability and requires a similarly lifelong investment in teaching and willingness to learn on the part of staff and parents. As behavior analysts, we know our students need to display skills not only at school, but also at home, in the community, or any other setting or situation where they might be needed. So it is our responsibility to actively include strategies to support that skill generalization as part of our intervention. Finally, we recognize that the time we have to teach while children are eligible to receive special education services is limited and precious. So for example, in a typical week, Students are at our school for about 30 hours each week, which you can see in the green bar here, about six hours a day for five days per week. And you can see that is very small compared to the time they spend out of school, which is the bars on the right in the red and blue, even if you don't count the time spent sleeping. In the US, students are entitled to receive special education services from ages three to 21. Now that sounds like a lot, but when you look at the average lifespan, that is really only 4% of someone's lifetime. So you can see that small green slice in the front of the pie chart there. So we know if we're going to maximize our students' potential, uh, we know we need to have an incredible partnership with our parents. And here we go. First and foremost, at Somerset Hills, we see that partnership as proactive. So together, we are planning in advance how to address problems we see now, um, how to teach independence as students grow up, and how to prevent possible problems in the future. So for example, the next shopping trip, the next vacation, teenage years, adulthood, um, and so forth. We first talked to parents about the importance of joining a team at intake, and we continue to message that frequently after they accept an offer of placement with us. We recognize that parents know their children best, and we know our science, so we bring those together to support the children's learning and development. Um, it is not a relationship where we mysteriously fix children that come to us. As Don Baer, a leader in our field, has said, they are not broken televisions and we are not a fix it shop. We are a team with parents as equal players and we coach them to respond effectively to their child's needs now and across their lifetime. At SHLI, we call this partnership home programming. And one part of that that we're talking about today is contingency management. By contingency management, we mean helping parents to identify and manage delivery of reinforcement consequences in everyday situations to help their children learn new skills and alternatives to inappropriate behavior. So why do we teach this to parents as a particular skill set? Well, for one, it is a way to help parents think more like behavior analysts. It is a part of our staff training that we realized we needed to extend to our home programming partnership as a way to support parents in developing even more complex skills um, that we would ask them to display later on when they're teaching their children um, more, 
more advanced um, skills that the children are learning. It's also a set of tools um, to help parents uh, teach specific things like social skills. Um, for example, uh, the types of behaviors that you can see here. And um, when children are engaging in lower amounts of undesired behavior, parents have that much more time to spend teaching, nurturing, and ultimately helping their children reach their full potential. While we know how powerful these teaching skills are, we also know that this does not come naturally to parents or to staff or to anyone. That's why we need to teach it. So we've carefully designed the teaching sequence for parents to be as errorless as possible so that parents can gradually learn more and more complex skills or manage more and more challenging situations while contacting successful outcomes with their child at each step of the way. First, we conduct some baseline sessions where we observe parents playing with their children and we collect some data on how parents are supporting language and responding to different behaviors from their children. We then sit down and conduct a workshop in which we explain how we'll be working side by side to coach them with positive and instructive feedback while they work with their child we provide rationales, explanations, we show them some video examples, and we do a little role play. After the workshop, we start hands-on coaching sessions. So during these sessions, we observe and collect data at the start of each session, then provide the parent with feedback to let them know what went well and what to keep doing more of and what could be different and to practice working on. We keep providing this feedback as the parent spends time with the child throughout the session. So specifically, we're teaching them to do the following things. First, we teach them to be vigilant for those times when their child is expressing a want or a need. Second, we help them to identify something they want as a teacher in that moment to improve the child's social skills. Then we teach them to communicate the connection between those two things to the child by making an explicit contingency statement, which we call a when-then statement, specifying the desired behavior for the child and what will be provided when the child does it. For example, say a child is reaching for a toy on a shelf but can't quite get it. The parent wants the child to learn to ask for help um, using vocal language. So we might teach the parent to say something like, when you say, help me please, then I can give you the toy. Or for example, a child is attempting to leave their chair during dinner. We might teach the parent to say something like, when you say all done, you can get down. Or when you eat one more bite of vegetables, then you can go play. Finally, we want to see the parent delivering what the child wants after the improved social behavior is observed. Of course, when and only when that occurs. We provide this coaching systematically across multiple dimensions, which you can see here, uh, across settings, across contexts, and on an explicit to implicit continuum. So for settings, we start contingency management coaching at school, which is a familiar and more controlled environment in which the child is more likely to be successful, which means parents are more likely to be successful and quickly contact reinforcement for managing contingencies correctly. We then move to settings and situations that have less and less predictability or control, like home and the community. Similarly, for contexts of behavior, we start with initiations because we can help parents to identify the reinforcer very clearly in these situations. As you move down the list from initiations to undesired behavior to anticipating undesired behavior, it can be much less obvious what the reinforcer might be. For example, in situations where it might be escape or avoidance um, or something that takes a little more analysis. Finally, we start by teaching parents to communicate contingencies explicitly 
with those vocal when then statements. So this is helpful to remind both the child and the parent of what the connection is between the desired behavior and the reinforcer, especially while the parent is first learning. Over time, we help parents to use more implicit ways of communicating um, contingencies that may look or sound a little more typical. Um, for example, just holding back the toy and waiting uh, without saying anything to the child. So the general framework is the same, but the specific steps and how long we spend on them are completely different for every child and parent according to their needs and according to what the data we collect show us. And I'll show you what that looks like in just a minute. So here are just a few more examples of what I mean by different contexts. So by that, we just mean different types of child behaviors or situations in which we want to see parents um, respond successfully. We break these out into initiations, which you can see an example here, a child requesting um, an item, um, a child requesting a parent's attention, for example, when the parent is um, otherwise engaged, the child might be interrupting. Um, a couple scenarios for teaching in response to undesired behaviors like splashing at the pool and other children are not liking that or tantrum behavior when a new food is presented. And finally, anticipating undesired behavior. For example, um, the child is playing with their toys, but it's time for dinner and we know that when we ask the child to put the toys away and come to dinner, there's often a tantrum. So now I'm going to show you a real life example of what a teaching sequence looked like for one parent and one child. So on this graph across the bottom, we have numbers of sessions. In the top panel, we have data for Cora, who is the mother, and that will be percentage of contingencies managed correctly. So for the first five teaching opportunities, we as instructors see in the session, did the parent make a contingency statement or otherwise communicate the contingency to the child? And for that same opportunity, did she, re uh, did she deliver the reinforcer appropriately? At the bottom, you will see on task behavior for Caleb, the child, and that's gonna be about the first five minutes or so of each session. You can see that in baseline, we started out while Cora and Caleb were playing in the gym at school. The blue dots, they're very dark. They almost look black. Um, on mine, they look blue. So on the top, those blue dots show that before intervention, we didn't see Cora providing many teaching opportunities for Caleb to use more language during interactions. We conducted the workshop and then in our first coaching condition, we provided teaching to Cora in the same setting um, to help Caleb use more language when he was initiating for toys and activities. You can see that Cora quickly began to display contingency management skills in this situation, coming up to 100%. Again, that's the blue data path on the top panel. So we then moved on to other situations at school, like doing a puzzle in the classroom, and then anticipating inappropriate behavior when Caleb was transitioning off of the iPad, which we know is very common, challenging situation for many of our students. We then moved to home, starting over with initiations, beginning to teach Cora to use implied ways to manage contingencies. So not just those vocal when then statements every time, and although it was initiations, it's a different setting. There are different items that Caleb might be um, initiating for. So again, a little bit of a different situation to provide our teaching. Uh, you can see Cora continues to meet criterion uh, quickly within uh, two to three data points uh, per condition. The family encountered some challenging behavior 
surrounding a non-preferred activity. That's what the NP stands for. So we did some teaching on our own first in school, and then we brought parents back in. Again, this is starting back in the school setting for this situation. Um, and we were quickly able to uh, move back to coaching sessions within the home setting. Um, across different non-preferred activities like putting on a coat and hat, uh, drinking from a new cup, and actually blowing out a birthday candle. We were then able to move into the community with Cora, shopping at the grocery store with Caleb and teaching him to stay close to her, keep his hands to himself, rather than touching all of the items in every aisle. Uh, we did add a behavioral contract uh, to help them be successful. This was something that was small and discreet. Um, we didn't feel the need to fade it. It was a helpful tool to um, prompt both mom and, and Caleb. Finally, we were able to fade our coaching interactions to see if Cora maintained her contingency management skills over time without our feedback. And you can see that she did both at home and in the community. And she also generalized her skills, as you can see in those open triangles, those are generalization assessment points um, across new situations, specifically uh, the doctor and the dentist office and uh, playing outside. And you can see that Caleb's on-task behavior, the data path with the green circles in the bottom panel, closely follows the path of Cora's contingency management performance showing that not only was Cora learning to display appropriate skills interacting with her child during these sessions, but Caleb was as well. Here is a different parent and child pair, Beth, the mother on the top, and Jaden, the child on the bottom. The letters above the graph are codes for different types of conditions, similar to what you just saw, but shorter. S for home, H, I'm sorry, S for school, H for home, I for initiations, and so on. You can see that the sequence is a little bit different. The number of conditions at home versus school versus community, a little different compared to the last graph, but ultimately leading to success across multiple settings and contexts for both the parent and the child. And on the right is the same child at the bottom, but with his father, Lou, in the blue circles. And you can see that even for a father and a mother within the same family, the, co the coaching conditions are individualized. We adapt our coaching even for two different parents with the same child. We know that everyone responds to different challenges differently, Everyone learns at a different pace, our students do, and so do our parents. Here's one final example, Harriet, the mother on top, and Susie, the daughter on bottom. Again, you can see, looking at the top panel with the blue circles, quick skill acquisition by Harriet, the mother, with small systematic changes from one condition to the next across a variety of situations. And again, a totally different sequence of coaching conditions designed just for this parent and um, this child. And here, actually also working on different social skills for this child, Susie, um, versus Jaden, the child in the last slide. But you can see that across each of these examples, the same coaching framework was part of this successful learning experience for parents from school to home to community and from initiations to undesired behavior to anticipating undesired behavior. And this ultimately led to the same outcome, parents being able to successfully manage the situations important to their family for their child. I do want to point out that patience is a very important part of this process. The changes in parent performance that we're celebrating did happen over a long time, which is a little bit hard to see from these graphs. So if we go back, 
uh, these data for Cora and Caleb actually represent about one year and three months, not including maintenance data and maintenance data were collected over about eight more months. For Jaden, these data represent about one year and seven months for each parent. And for Harriet and Susie, this is about two years worth of data. So of course, some of that time, that um, length of time is due to scheduling between parents and teachers, but part of it is also purposeful due to taking those small, careful and patient steps, which we know leads to lasting and durable change rather than a quick fix that is not going to be maintained. And it's something that we do have to help remind parents of um, as we go through the contingency management and coaching sessions. And we also find it helpful to remind parents of um, these considerations as well. We remind them that they're more likely to be successful when they do the following. For one, to meet the child where they are. We may have big goals, but we need to start where the child is, not our final destination. So maybe starting by expecting a child to use a single word to ask for something rather than a whole long sentence. We also, oh, I don't see my slides. Oh, there they are, great. <laughs> we also teach them to choose words other than no, stop, or don't. So sorry, um, Anna, if you're speaking to me, I'm not sure if I can hear you. <laughs> I'm not sure if you're trying to tell me something. I'm gonna keep going, I think. Um, so we also teach them to choose words other than no, stop, or don't, um, as these words don't communicate what to do, and they also don't communicate what happens when you do it. We also say to... Emily, can you hear me now? Yes. Hi, I can. Hi, hi, yes. And it's nearly time to finish, yes, so just make the conclusion. Okay. Great. Um, I'm sorry about that. I had a little bit more, but I'm going to wrap up. Um, so we teach them to celebrate small successes and to have a plan. And I'm just going to, I had um, a little bit of a funny story about what not to do in the interest of time. We're going to wrap up. I have a very quick story to share. We talk about contingency management as a way to empower parents. And here's a real life example. A student of ours went to the emergency room at the hospital. They broke their leg. They were not able to leave until they could use crutches, but they refused to do so. And the parent was trying everything to try to get them to use the crutches, um, waiting and waiting hours. And finally, the child said, I need to use the restroom. And the parent remembered their contingency management coaching, went, when you use your crutches, then you'll be able to get to the restroom. The child was very motivated to use the restroom, hopped right up on the crutches and was able to go home right away afterwards. So win-win. Um, thank you so much for your time. Thank you, Emily. That was very interesting. Yes, this is the email address when the, uh, our uh, the people can ask you some questions. Yes, you are very welcome. And then we thank you because parents are the most important partners in Absolutely. for us. So that was just excellent uh, speech. So thank you very much. Thank you so and much. Now it's uh, time for very short five minutes break. Hello, Ala. Hello. <laughs> I am so glad to see you and hear you. Wow. Yes. Yes. I did something wrong first time. It happens. It really happens. Uh, we are very glad you joined us. And I just would like to introduce once more because we told whole story about you. So uh, I can't add anything more. Uh, now your turn and uh, you will be talking about developing of applied behavior analysis in Ukraine. So you are mostly welcome and we are 
we will we, we would like to listen to you <laughs> thank you anna thank so you. i will talk about a little bit about aba and the situation in ukraine and i will talk about our problems and our achievements so a little bit of our history uh, um, since Soviet Union times, uh, there has been only an old Soviet special education, defectological named support system insisting of the segregation uh, from society of children and adults with intellectual disabilities, including those with autism. Emphasis uh, was placed on their disabilities and their impossibility to their integration in the educational system. This situation uh, was until 2017 when a law about inclusion was adopted on, in Ukraine. Uh, also, in Ukraine, uh, were ratified uh, different regulations and uh, uh, different uh, documents about uh, education and about inclusion. Uh, one of them uh, was uh, Salaman's statement. And uh, in this uh, statement was a very good phrase. Regular schools with this inclusive or uh, orientation are the most effective means of combating discrimination, uh, discriminatory attitudes, creating welcoming communities, building an inclusive society and achieving, achieving education for all. Moreover, they provide an effective education of the majority of children and improve the effective uh, efficiency and ultimately uh, the uh, cost effectiveness of the entire educational education system. It's very important uh, and it's a basement uh, for our law legislation and uh, for uh, providing behavior analysis in uh, our educational system. Uh, first step uh, to, uh, towards establishing ABA in Ukraine uh, were uh, different. Uh, on around 2010, a self-proclaimed specialist started working with children with autism and it was a big problem for the parents and for the children too. Uh, they had no professional skills or knowledges. Uh, and parents of children with autism started to look for qualified specialists and real support. Uh, uh, they found uh, BCBA from Israel, Yulia Ertz, uh, with verified course sequence uh, in behavior analysis. And I finished uh, these courses, this is why I became a behavior analyst. And in 2014, Professional Society in Behavior Analyst was established in Ukraine. It was the specialists who also finished these courses. And my colleague decided uh, to uh, uh, found some organization uh, when, uh, in what uh, we, could, uh, we can show uh, the high quality of professional uh, work. And we start uh, to work in uh, Ukrainian uh, Association of Behavior Analysts. We provided uh, different uh, events uh, until uh, 2022. Uh, but uh, all these uh, events uh, were conducted during uh, the war because the war started in 2014. Uh, in 2022, it was very hard time for us. I was in Mariupol, as my colleague uh, mentioned, and uh, it was uh, two uh, centers. Uh, first center was in Donetsk, and second center was in Mariupol, and it was it were destroyed totally. 
but I continue to work. And uh, with our uh, association, we uh, created a site uh, for our organization. And in this site, uh, our uh, parents, uh, Ukrainian parents, and uh, other specialists could find uh, the specialist in applying behavior analysis uh, in different uh, parts of our country, uh, in different cities. Uh, we develop, uh, developed uh, criteria of professional competence of behavior analysts. And we uh, continue to uh, collaborate with um, uh, Eurobre project and develop uh, where we developed uh, uh, their uh, professional uh, uh, standards. Uh, and it is uh, the basement for Ukrainian standards, and we work on it. Uh, yes, uh, in Ukraine now, uh, so in January 2022, it was uh, in our organization 28 full members. Uh, there are uh, six BCBA and BCABA and 22 uh, persons who successfully passed uh, the VCS and uh, in behavior analysis and 28 associated members. Uh, this is students of these courses. Uh, in Ukraine, uh, worked uh, more than 10 uh, centers of ABA in different cities. And uh, now we have uh, the next situation. Uh, now we have a uh, total uh, totally uh, 68 uh, members of our organization. So we continue to expand. Uh, about the centers of ABA. In, the cen in ABA centers, uh, we provide uh, different ABA programs. In my center, uh, so now uh, I opened a new one center in Kiev, and uh, we have uh, an ABA specialist and speech therapy. And we provide uh, an individual ABA program and group ABA program. We continue to prepare our students uh, for school and for uh, kindergarten. And it's uh, important that we can uh, work in inclusion too. Uh, and our legislation, Ukrainian legislation, uh, uh, give us the possibility to help uh, the, ch the child, to the child uh, with uh, intellectual disabilities in uh, ordinary uh, classroom. Uh, and we can use uh, some AB program to help this student. Uh, also, uh, our organization uh, try to uh, connect with European University and uh, one of that is Masaryk University. And now we uh, will try to start Erasmus program uh, with educational package uh, for pre-service and in-service teacher and social workers and other helping uh, professional to support the effective inclusion of children with autism and related development uh, disorders in education. So we uh, hope uh, to um, implement some uh, ABA program in our higher education. It, it will be our first step because uh, now in Ukraine we have only uh, private uh, VCS courses. Uh, 
also we have some challenges and we try to solve it. Uh, not every specialist uh, adheres uh, the ethical code and we provide some training for uh, Ukrainian um, behavior specialists to understand uh, their problem and to try to uh, solve some uh, some situation with client, uh, clients and uh, with uh, uh, the personality in the school in kindergarten. Uh, also, we don't have uh, uh, some program uh, to uh, program in applied behavior analysis uh, to prepare a real uh, behavior analysts so um, our uh, hope is uh, the next step uh, will be uh, the vcs uh, program in some of uh, ukrainian university also we have a problem uh, with behavior analysts who are uh, not recognized uh, by the domestic educational system and now uh, uh, ukrainian association of behavior analysts uh, start to prepare some professional uh, norms uh, to provide uh, uh, to, to connect with uh, ukrainian ministry and start the process uh, of creating the profession of uh, behavior analyst and behavior instructor. And Ukraine needs to develop national certification too. We don't have this experience and we connect with our colleagues with, uh, with, uh, in, our, in other uh, European countries. And uh, with their help, uh, we will do that, I hope. Now we have uh, different uh, 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 the Ukrainian specialists in different countries of Ukraine, and we hope uh, they will return uh, and continue to provide uh, behavior therapy for our children. Uh, with Masaryk University, uh, we provided uh, a program uh, with Ukrainian refugees who are uh, in Czech Republic. And uh, we will continue this program uh, with the uh, help of Ukrainian specialists. So we try to survive and uh, I hope we will win. Thank you for your attention. You can see information about Ukrainian Association of Behavior Analysts in our site. And if you would like to, uh, if you have some question, you can write me. Thank you. Ala, thank you very much. Uh... <laughs> Yeah, I just uh, wanted to say that all of us are very impressed uh, that you are still trying to establish ABA treatment uh, for kids with autism in Ukraine and to try to keep together after all the horrors of the war. I know that also your situation was very difficult and you are still trying to develop ABA in Ukraine and thank you for presenting this situation and I think it's very hard for us all of us to really understand um, and imagine maybe not understand but imagine what you have to go through so all of specialists from Poland and I'm sure all the friends from ABA uh, society cross fingers uh, for your future and all of us will be able to, to help you as much as you will ever need. So uh, thank you once more and hope 
all everything will be okay very very soon now i would like to introduce uh, sigmund eldevik and he's uh, associated professor at oslo metropolitan university uh, sigmund i can't see you and can you just uh, show yourself? You need to um, press. Okay. <laughs> now I am all. Okay. So um, I just uh, would like to say that thanks to Sigmund, we were able to run a lot of research at our institute and um, this cooperation is just wonderful. I'm very happy we work together. And uh, I would like to say that uh, I hope the cooperation will last next year. New projects will come and new our therapies will be able to defend next maybe doctor thesis at Oslo University. Um, the title of pres presentation is intensity and parental involvement is related to outcome of early behavioral intervention so as we always say the intensity is um, and parents involvement are two the most important things oh sigmund i can see you maybe we can try Okay, I think it's better. okay. We can see you. We can hear you. Wow! Wonderful. Okay. It, it so you know, I will just uh, let right now speak uh, Sigmund Elderly. Hello, Sigmund. By the way. <laughs> Hello. Hi. Hi. Uh, so I, I'm leaving you <laughs> now. Yes, okay, I will just uh, jump right in then. So the, the topic of my talk today is um, whether intensity and parental involvement uh, is related to outcome of early behavioral intervention. Uh, but uh, first a question, how, how can we measure intensity and how can we measure uh, parental involvement? So uh, just to remind you, I think uh, many of you will be familiar with this, but uh, these are also uh, core elements of an early intervention, uh, intervention program. So these uh, the parents should be uh, serve as active co-therapist. Uh, intervention should be done both at home uh, and in other environments and um, programming should be intensive and it's a bit of a debate but uh, at least uh, 20 hours a week seems to be uh, uh, the minimum okay so what we have done is we have uh, used something called a periodic service review and this is based on obm principles and, and total quality uh, management so and you can use this to uh, and the, the, the principles of it is that it is user driven so in a sense you develop your own standards for what you consider to be an optimal provision for any particular child it's transparent in the sense that everyone involved have standards to live up to and these are known to everyone involved uh, and it's uh, broken down into measurable items that are uh, operationally defined and, and uh, periodically measured. And it, it turns out, by the way, that just the fact that you do this and start to monitor uh, things in itself leads to improved quality. So th this is, uh, you're not meant to, to read, read this, just relax, this is, this is how we have arranged it. So on, uh, we have just listed things that we think is uh, 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 part of a, an optimal program and then we score it every month along this line it's uh, in an excel sheet so uh, you give a zero if it's not done and a one if it's done and in this way you can uh, get the percentage uh, score which is also representing your quality so total done 
items divided by the total possible done, done items, and then you multiply by 100, and you get your quality score. And you can graph it, this, uh, put it on the wall if you want to, and it creates sort of a visual feedback loop. Um, for many, uh, it is uh, a, a powerful uh, motivation. And in, in addition, it, it can serve to pinpoint what you are doing well uh, and what you are uh, not doing so well in, any, uh, in, in each case. So this is done on every single uh, case we have. And it can pinpoint it on a case basis and also on your organization as a whole. You can uh, analyze the data and look into this. And this is, by the way, a typical uh, graph. So since you are supposed to make standards that are optimal, in most cases, we start out quite low. So maybe around 40, 50%. And as the months go by, they, it gradually increases until you end up somewhere between 80 or 90% or whatever you consider to be uh, an acceptable level of quality. So this has been replicated across uh, many uh, sites and centers, this, this uh, finding. Okay, so back to our uh, project. We had uh, children, uh, all children that were referred to our center in Oslo and a similar center in Bergen in Norway who met uh, the following criteria. They were diagnosed with autism. They were between 18 months and six years at intake, and they had treatment for about two years. In addition, we had a, a treatment as usual uh, comparison group from a, a nearby uh, university hospital. And we divided these groups based on, uh, on, uh, on the intensity of intervention. So we have a higher intensity group, a lower intensity group, and finally the treatment as usual group. Um, uh, the main difference between the behavioral groups is, is the weekly hours. We had an average of 13 hours in the lower intensity group and 22 hours in the higher intensity group. And, and they are more or less similar, similar on, on um, all other intake uh, variables. So it's important also to keep in mind because this is a bit of a minefield in some ways. So the way we count hours is uh, we include uh, the hours that are done one-to-one -one in a separate uh, teaching room, uh, small groups, uh, things you do in the unit, uh, and things also that you do at home. So the main thing for uh, the, the main... Um, requirement for, for being counted as uh, intervention hour is that it is uh, it's a written goal that is broken down and uh, and data is collected on it in the same way as, as uh, any other uh, ABA program. So as long as it's, it's done that way, it doesn't really matter in what setting you are doing it. Um, but we count all the time that you spend on this as uh, intervention time. Okay, so this is just another slide quickly to show you that the groups are similar on, on diagnosis categories with autism and, and on uh, uh, gender distribution. So uh, outcome measures, uh, we had the, the Vineland done, we had a measure of uh, autism severity, severity the, the CARS, we had uh, a measure of intelligence for two of the groups uh, of problem behavior and of preferences for uh, social and non-social stimuli. So it's uh, sort of trying to implement uh, the recent recommendations for uh, measuring outcome of, of intervention that, and uh, the recommendation uh, I've been a part of this group that, that came up with this, by the way. So it, it is uh, the recommendation that we brought, measure a broader set of outcome measure, measure uh, outcome. So um, we have not done everything that's recommended. You, you should also provide some uh, quality of life measure, uh, I think, and more directly 
measure the social validity and acceptability of the intervention and, and also measure if there are any adverse events, any negative sides of side effects of the therapy. But uh, we at least we have done part of it. We have a measure of, uh, of uh, autism severity, the CARS. Probably, again, many of you are familiar with. It's a 15-item questionnaire. And uh, you give scores on each of, of uh, these uh, questions. And you end up with a score between 15 and 60. And this is, again, the raw score is, is, uh, is used to give you a classification of how uh, severe uh, the autism is. Uh, we also have the aberrant behavior checklist. This is, uh, I believe, now out in a revised version. Uh, so it, it measures problem behavior. It, has, it is very widely used and it has uh, decent psychometric properties. So it, it is a bit old, uh, old fashioned in a way. It has a scale for irritability, which is uh, essentially, self injurious behavior, temper tantrums, aggressiveness, lethargy, meaning uh, sluggish, withdrawn, uh, prefers to be alone, and so on. Stereotypy. I don't think I need to explain. Uh, hyperactivity also, it's very active, uh, disturbs, distractible, and uh, uh, inappropriate speech is uh, echo speech, speaking too loudly, and, and so forth. Um, okay, uh, we have also this measure of uh, preferences, uh, the SMARC. Um, so social stimuli they are, and non-social stimuli are, are measured on a, a questionnaire that we give to staff and, and parents that know the child well. So typical social uh, preferences and toys, 23 items, and we simply count the number of yeses on this. And similarly with uh, non-social stimuli, typical uh, restricted interests, um, the repetitive movements and so on. And, and we simply count the number of yeses on this one as well. So uh, um, the treatment as usual group, similar resources as uh, the EIBI groups, instead of the BCBA or the supervisor, uh, the ABA supervisor, it's a special education teachers that, that teacher that provides uh, consultation in the same uh, number of hours as a typical uh, supervisor on an EIBI program. But we don't have any accurate data, unfortunately, on, on time spent on weekly goals. Um, uh, so we have just an estimation at least five hours plus. And it's uh, basically a, a common eclectic uh, provision, eclectic mix of alternative communication, often some ABA to teach toileting and, and things like that. Total communication, sensory motor therapies, teach, uh, writing, swimming, physiotherapy, and other uh, methods, things that the teacher will come up with based on their own experience and, and discretion. Okay, moving on to the results uh, for the Wineland. We had uh, data from all three groups, and this is my favorite way of displaying outcome data. It's, um, it's uh, one, one bar here represents the changes for one individual child. And they are sorted from the most negative change to the most positive change. So you see the, you can get the mean for the group, which was 11.6 plus for the higher intensity group and 0 0.3 for a lower intensity group and the treatment as usual about the same, well, lost a little bit. So it shows group averages and it also shows the, the huge individual variation that is, is quite uh, typical following intensive interventions. Uh, if we compute, uh, some of you may be familiar with a reliable change index. It's a 
it, it's an index that tells you how large a change uh, needs to be for you to be 95% sure that it is the intervention that it is that is responsible for the change. So when we have computed this, uh, we have found that uh, following EIBI, about 20% of the kids reach this uh, benchmark uh, of 20%. And if we apply this to our current study, we found that the high in, in the higher intensity group, we are almost at that benchmark, whereas no of the kids in either the lower intensity or the treatment as usual group uh, will uh, meet uh, the criteria of 21, like uh, the points change on the line now. IQ, uh, we only have data for lower intensity and treatment as usual group. Um, so, but there are some uh, big differences here. The lower intensity group has a change of 10 plus IQ points, whereas the treatment as usual group lose a point. But again, you see it's great variability within both groups. Uh, the reliable change index for IQ, we have found to be 27 points, very, very high. And uh, we expect 30% of the kids to reach this benchmark following standard EIBI. And if you look at the lower uh, intensity group, we have we are at not not there. We are at about 11%, whereas no kids in the treatment as usual group meet this uh, very, very strict criterion, I must say. So uh, if we plot our results just for the fun of it, we can plot it in a dose response uh, graph like this. And we had uh, about 11 points IQ change, 13 hours. And if we look at what other studies uh, are reporting, we are falling right on, on the line where we would expect, uh, would, would be expected to be. So in that sense, it's, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's in a way validates this those response relationships that we have seen uh, reported in, in many of the reviews of EIDI. Okay, moving on to autism severity. In this case, we only have a comparison between lower and higher intensity. Um, but again, same pattern, the higher intensity groups uh, is doing much better. They lose 11 points on average on the cars, whereas the lower intensity group, they do a lot better, but they only lose half the points, about five points. Um, problem behavior. Um, this is again only data from the higher and, and lower intensity groups and uh, we see same uh, those response pattern basically the reductions in problem behavior are much larger in the higher intensity group all over the board um, essentially and uh, moving on to social pre uh, preferences we unfortunately for this we have more data, but at, at this point, I can only present pre and post for the lower intensity group. Uh, so we have for social preferences, pre, about 17, and this is the non-social, and this is post, and we can see that they, uh, the preferences for social uh, stimuli has increased somewhat, whereas this preferences for non-social stimuli has decreased somewhat. But this is, this is all uh, very uh, preliminary, but the pattern looks good, I think, so far. So uh, back to the, the original question, yes, um, there are differences uh, in outcome and the differences between the groups in this, in this case was mainly on intensity, but also on parental involvement. And they also contributed with, with some of the hours that turned this group into a higher intensity group. And this is uh, reflected in the, the quality scores also. So looking at the, the lower intensity group would be the red one and the higher intensity group is the blue one. So parental invo involvement and um, intensity are, are measured in this uh, uh, system and it, it gives, um, you can see the difference between the groups uh, in, in the scores based on this. 
So this this is just again don't try to read it, but it's these uh, highlighted items are are things that measure intensity and, and parental involvement. Okay, uh, so across all the EIBI, EIBI uh, programs, our data shows that the physical intervention conditions, the folder and registrations routines, and the evaluation routines are about the same. Uh, what we struggle with, and uh, also what uh, is the differences between a group again, is the parental involvement, uh, getting intervention and uh, treatment done in the home and also getting the intensity, the recommended number of minimum 20 hours. Uh, let's see. Yeah, so just some thoughts uh, for how to deal with this. It's, uh, I think we can do better if we, we, if we organize things in a, a center as you do in, uh, in, in Gdansk. So that's one uh, thing we have been looking into instead of like we do in Norway, we move around in, in the local uh, preschools where all kids with autism are enrolled. And that has some positive sides. Uh, you can have very easily set up interaction with typical peers, but it also has some down downsides when it comes to providing the recommended intensity among other things. So take home message that uh, i think is that these findings should be used to uh, not for not to argue for lower intensity intervention but to argue for more comprehensive higher quality uh, uh, and quantity of eibi and this this uh, i showed now two outcome after two years but this study we published a couple of years ago and this is in in the european journal of behavior analysis and that study here reported outcome after one year and what we see now is when we look at the two-year data that the differences between the groups are um, are somewhat bigger than after one year so that's all i had thank you for attention and thank you for having me here uh, Anna. thank you thank you uh sigmund it was really interesting uh, to see again your just wonderful research very comprehensive and thank you for sharing your knowledge with us. My and pleasure. we are really proud we are cooperating with you at really close basis. So yes. thank you. It's, that's mutual. I hope we can continue. <laughs> yes, thank you. <laughs> and now we will move to our last lecture. And uh, I would like to welcome uh, Alison Gillis and Katie Wilson from New York Child Learning Institute in USA. Uh, New York uh, uh, um, Child Learning Institute is also uh, cooperating with us uh, uh, and they are also uh, co-founders of uh, Alliance for Scientific Autism Intervention. I can see you, Alison and Katie, and you need to, oh yes, Hello, Katie. Hello, thank you. Nice to uh, see you and hello, nice. uh, Alison. Hi. Great, we have no technical problems. Uh, so now Hi. I will give you a voice. Uh, you will uh, talk to us about teaching social skills to children with autism, promoting peer and family interactions. So yes, welcome you to our symposium. Thank you so thank much. You. Uh, good evening, I'm Allison Gillis, and I am joining you with Katie Wilson here in New York. We have been colleagues at the New York Child Learning Institute for about 10 years now, and we've worked collaboratively on many things, but this is actually our first time presenting a conference together in a conference. Um, so we thank you for this opportunity and for your time tonight. We are so glad to be a part of your wonderful and very oh. important event and are eager to share some information about social skills. You know, like many of you, we have worked on teaching social skills to children with autism from as young as about two years old up to 21. And we are truly devoted to the acquisition of these responses, given the impact that they can have on the lives of our learners. Um, I know that time is limited and it's getting quite late over in Poland compared to New York right now. 
Um, so without further ado, I will let Katie take over and share some really interesting research and videos related to social skills with peers. Thank you, Allison. So today we will be talking with you about teaching social skills to children with autism, promoting peer and family interactions. A core symptom of autism is a deficit in the display of appropriate social skills. Social skills are a complex class of responses that relate to one's communication and interactions with other people. Although there is no explicit definition, this class of behavior may be best conceived of as those responses that increase the likelihood of producing positive consequences with other people while minimizing negative consequences. For example, eye contact, prosody of speech, gestures, affect, language and interactions, joint attention, and play behavior are all important responses that can affect environmental outcomes. The extent to which one displays each or a combination of these responses can contribute to the likelihood with which that person will function competently in society. Social skills are fundamental to one's development and correspond with the likelihood of success in various avenues of life, including academics, vocations, and peer and family relationships. In fact, individuals with autism often report having few or no friends and a desire for more peer interactions. They may express more loneliness and be at increased risk for peer rejection and isolation than their typically developing peers. With regard to the home environment, siblings of children with autism reported having lower levels of intimacy, pro-social behavior, nurturance by their siblings with, and with autism in comparison to levels reported by their siblings of typically developing children. However, family plays a central role in the child's developmental outcome. And family members have uh, individuals with autism have critical con contrib are critical contrib contributors to their success without whom gains are less likely to be maintained. Many individuals with autism demonstrate deficits in one or more areas of social behavior. Given the impact that social skills can have on many important areas of life, it is imperative that we target the acquisition of as many of these responses as possible to lay the groundwork for positive relationships, as well as opportunities for further progress and development. For the purpose of, of today's presentation, we will be focusing specifically on interactions with peers and family members. There is an extensive amount of research demonstrating the effectiveness of various behavioral interventions to teach social interactions, including, but not limited to the strategies listed here. Although we do incorporate all of these strategies into our teaching of social interaction skills at Nicely, today we will just be covering scripts and script fading we would like to discuss some peer reviewed research as well as integrate some of our own experiences with this procedure. Script feeding is a procedure that we use quite often at our school, both in our daily instruction and across research studies. Scripts enable people with autism to engage in everyday conversation and to practice skills that are important for social interactions. They provide an opportunity for individuals with autism to learn both verbal and nonverbal components of conversation, such as approaching others, initiating, orienting to those while speaking, waiting while others talk, and responding to others. A script is a written or audio taped word, phrase, or sentence that is presented as a model to teach conversation. As the child learns to imitate the script, the script is faded from end to beginning until no words remain. It is worth mentioning the seminal book, Teaching Conversation to Children with Autism, authored by Drs. McClanahan and Krantz, to whom we owe not only the pleasure of having worked with, but also credit the design of this procedure. This book has been translated in Polish as well, and is a great resource for much more information on scripts and script feeding as well as any questions or troubleshooting as you go. 
There's a great deal of research devoted to the use of scripts and script feeding to teach interaction skills to indiv individuals with autism. This list includes just some of the peer reviewed research that has been conducted using the script feeding procedure to teach peer interactions to individuals with autism. Today, we will look at one of these studies that we conducted at our school a few years back. This study was conducted in 2016 and is titled The Effect of a Script Fading Procedure on Social Interactions Among Young Children with Autism. The purpose of this study was to teach three young children with autism to emit social interactions to one another and to transfer control to the natural environment. The participants included two boys and one girl with autism between the ages of six and nine years old. All three demonstrated deficits in peer interaction skills. During a session, the participants followed activity schedules that consisted of leisure and academic tasks, including movies, music, coloring, and puzzles, as well as math, reading, and spelling. During baseline, scripts were not present. During training, scripts were superimposed directly onto those items. Examples of scripts included, hey, check this out and take a look. And here we have some of the examples of leisure items with scripts superimposed upon them. The scripts are difficult to see in the photos, but are circled in red and say, hey, look at this on the toy car and check it out on the DVD case. The location of these scripts on the items would change each day. The dependent variables in this study were the number of scripted and unscripted interactions emitted during a given session. A scripted interaction was one that matched the printed script provided for the participant. An unscripted interaction was a statement that differed from the scripts by more than certain parts of speech, such as conjunctions, articles, prepositions, pronouns, or changes in verb tense. So for example, if the script was, it is fun, then saying it is cool would be scored as unscripted. Here we have a sample of the scripts that were provided for each of the three participants. You can see the full scripts provided in the first column, followed by each of the five feeding steps. Scripts were feeded from end to beginning, one word at a time, until they were fully removed. So for example, if we look at the first script for our participant, Aaron, at the bottom, you can see that the first full script is, look at my cool stuff. With feeding step one, the last word is removed, and the script is now, look at my cool. With each feeding step, one word is removed until feeding step five, the script is fully removed. Here are the results of the study. This graph displays the number of scripted and unscripted interactions emitted across sessions for the three participants. The closed circles represent scripted interactions and the open circles are unscripted interactions. Each of the arrows denotes a fading step for the scripts. You can see that during baseline, the first participant did not emit any interactions. The other two participants did emit some interactions but their performance was not reliable across sessions. When scripts were introduced, which is right after the dashed condition line, the number of scripted and unscripted interactions systematically increased across participants. You could see a functional relationship between the script feeding procedure and the number of independent peer interactions emitted. Here's a video showing two of the participants during the baseline condition before scripts were introduced. You will see that they follow their activity schedules, but do not emit any interactions to one another. So if you wouldn't mind please playing video one, thank you. You can have a minute. 
And here we have the same two participants after scripts have been fully faded from the activities in the training condition. You will see nice conversational language and engagement between the two of them. Overall, this study showed a functional relation between the script fading procedure and the number of peer interactions emitted by the participants. This study also successfully transferred control from the textual scripts to naturally occurring stimuli in the children's environment, such as toys, coloring books, and movies. And these are stimuli that in the presence of which conversation could typically occur for children. Similar procedures have been used in our daily programming across many learners at Nicely. For example, we have taught learners to interact with one another during lunch or snack, during games, during gym activities, or during outings in the community. Although we won't review each learner's particular script fading procedure, we would like to show you, share with you videos that show some of the wonderful outcomes we have had using script fading. This video shows great conversation during a lunch activity amongst some of our adolescent learners. Prior to the use of scripts, their interactions were minimal or did not occur at all. But you will see that after scripts were faded, they continued to engage in conversation with one another. Well, my favorite restaurant is DJ's Brew House, I, and I have been there too. And I apologize if the audio may be hard to hear on your end, but this video is similar and that the interactions were taught during a lunch activity, but this time while they're out to lunch at a restaurant. And this last video shows nice interactions while two of our learners are transitioning back to school from being out in the community. Again, this is after scripts had been fully faded and the skill was maintained very nicely. So Isaac, what do you want to do today? I mean, what do you want to do on weekend? So although there are several studies that have targeted social interactions with peers, the research on interactions with family members is a bit more limited. As Katie had mentioned earlier, family is incredibly important in development and incorporating family into the acquisition of social skills can have such a beneficial, benefit, beneficial outcome and create a more positive family dynamic. So it's an area that warrants more research and also more efforts on our part to incorporate family members into our teaching. 
So the next study that we would like to share with you is titled Script Fading for Children with Autism, Generalization of Social Initiation Skills from School to Home. The purpose of this study was to teach three children with autism to emit social initiations across various activities in the school setting and also to assess generalization in the untrained home setting with their sibling. The participants included three boys with autism between the ages of eight to 10 years. All three had demonstrated deficits in initiating to their peers and their parents had reported minimal initiations occurring at home. Training was conducted at the school and generalization was assessed in each of their homes with their typically developing siblings who were between five and eight years old. During a session, the participants engaged in activities such as building Lego models, playing computer games, and eating lunch or a snack. During baseline, scripts were not present, but during training, scripts were superimposed directly onto those items for those activities in a manner that was similar to the previous study. Scripts were never present in the home setting where we assessed generalization. We measured the number of unscripted initiations emitted across each activity in both the school and the home settings using the same definition as the one that Katie had reviewed earlier. So this study was different in that it covered both avenues of targeting social skills with peers and also with family members. This is just an example of the computer activity with scripts superimposed upon it. You can see the five different scripts in different locations on the computer, and these locations varied each day. The scripts included statements such as, computer games are fun, and check out what I'm playing. And this was done in a similar way for the Lego and the lunch or snack activities. Again, we have an example of the scripts and script fading steps across the three activities for one of our participants, Ollie. This was very similar to, one, to the one that we had showed you earlier, where the first column contains the full script uh, provided for each activity. And then each of the following columns is the successive removal of one word at a time from the end of that script until all of the scripts were fully removed from the items. And I know that was a very shortened explanation of the procedures, but um, we just want to run through the results that were obtained. This graph shows the number of unscripted initiations emitted across sessions by the one participant, Ali, for each of the three different activities. The closed circles on the graph display the number of unscripted initiations that he emitted in school with his peers, and the open triangles display the number of unscripted initiations that he emitted in the home setting with his sister. So you can see that during baseline, he emitted few, if any, initiations in either the school or the home settings. But with the introdu introduction of that script fading procedure, there was a systematic increase in the number of initiations that were emitted across activities with his peers. And once those scripts were fully faded in the school setting, which is denoted by the arrow on the graph, you can see that the initiations at home also show a systematic increase. And these results were similar for our other two participants, um, but for the sake of time, we just included this graph. So now we'd like to share with you a video segment that demonstrates the initiating behavior before and after training for that one participant, Ali. These are videos in his home setting only, which again was used to, general, to, show, uh, to assess generalization but just to show you the change in those sibling interactions that we saw. So if you could please start um, video six, thank you. Me. Yellow 
helicopter or the red truck? I'm already doing it. He's doing the yellow airplane. Maybe I'm, I'm doing the orange fire engine. I'm doing a fire engine. Oh, red fire engine. Firefighters, fire truck to the rescue. Maeve, Maeve, did you get a letter and you mailed it? So again, there was a functional relation between the script fading procedure and the number of unscripted initiations emitted by the three participants. And it's that video really just exemplifies the nice change in behavior and that sibling interaction that was able to be achieved. Um, this procedure was an effective method for promoting the generalization of social initiations from school with their peers to the untrained home setting with their siblings. Unfortunately, we don't have videos of our other learners from NICE engaging in interactions with their family members at this time, although we do practice these skills in the homes of many of them as well. So there are many effective strategies that can be used to teach social skills to individuals with autism. The script fading procedure is just one of them that can be incorporated into our everyday teaching to strengthen the development of a learner's social skills repertoire. Our learner's display of these skills should not be limited to instructors. Peers and family members serve as social partners with whom many interactions occur that can affect development and levels of intimacy, pro-social behavior, and nurturance. So therefore, it is imperative to include such important people into our training. And promoting the acquisition of this behavior can contribute to the growth of positive relationships, as well as other opportunities for further progress and development. So we thank you again for your time. Um, I think it might be pronounced Kanjuyan. Uh, Kanjuyan? <laughs> I'm not sure how to pronounce it in Polish. You can teach me. Um, <laughs> yeah, next time. <laughs> We invite you to. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Alison and Katie, for sharing you so your much. experience, your knowledge, your research. It's uh, always uh, is, uh, uh, inspiring us uh, to do our work the best. So thank you very much. Thank you thank very you much. much for a wonderful lecture and. It was a great pleasure to have you all here and it was our last presentation so we just would like to say thank you to all uh, our attenders there were uh, around i think more than 1000 people all together uh, so it was really a big big event but for this who couldn't attend us they can listen to the uh, Paul symposium on our webpage www.wrd.pl and uh, can listen to whole symposium because it was recorded. Of course, see you next year.